Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's roundtable regarding the proposal to amend PCAOB auditing standards related to the auditor's responsibility for considering a company's non-compliance with laws and regulations, commonly referred to as NOCLAR. The PCAOB's mission is to protect investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. Protecting investors drives everything we do including the NOCLAR proposal to be discussed today. Non-compliance with laws and regulations can have devastating consequences for investors. When sanctions, fines, and civil settlements directly affect a company's bottom line or reputational damage causes a company's stock value to decline, investors are negatively impacted. Like all standards on our agenda, we are committed to getting this right, and public comment is essential to that process. We want to hear from all stakeholders, and that is why we are here today. Thank you to the panelists who will be joining us. We look forward to learning from your comments, and thank you from the public that's watching. The comment period is open until March 18th, and we want to hear from you. Today's roundtable has been driven by our hardworking, dedicated staff. Thank you to Barbara Vantage, our Chief Auditor and Director of Professional Standards at the PCAOB. Martin Schmalz, our Chief Economist and Director of the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, and all of their teams and colleagues who are working hard to protect investors every day. With that, I would like to turn the roundtable over to Barn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Williams, and to all of our board members for joining us today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Barbara Vanich, Chief Auditor and Director of Professional Standards at the PCOB. As Erica noted, I'm joined by Martin Schmalz, Chief Economist and Director of the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, and it's certainly our pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Martin and I are joined by Karthik Ramana. Karthik is a Professor of Business and Public Policy at the University of Oxford's Blavatnik School of Government, who uh, we're very lucky to have. He's taken a partial public service leave, leave to work with us and advise the PCOB. Uh, we would like to welcome you to this staff-hosted roundtable on the auditor's responsibility for a company's non-compliance with laws and regulations, which I'll just refer to after this is no CLAR. We want to welcome our panelists, board members, and the public, public watching this meeting. Uh, before we get started, I'll give the disclaimer for myself, Martin, and Karthik, and any PCOB staff speaking throughout the day. Our views are our own and do not necessarily reflect views of the board, individual board members, or staff. We would also like to remind those listening that the comment period will be open until March 18th, 2024. We welcome all comments. The staff are particularly interested in substantive comments from the public concerning the roundtable topics and any points raised during the roundtable. On June 6, 2023, the PCOB proposed amendments to PCOB auditing standards related to a company's noncompliance with laws and regulations. We received over 140 comment letters on that proposal, and from those comment letters, the staff have identified several topics for which we believe additional information will be helpful in developing our recommendation for the board. Today's roundtable will be organized into three panels. From now until 11.30 a.m., we will focus on the identification of laws and regulations relevant to the audit of a company's financial statements. Uh, then we will have a short break and reconvene from 12.30 to 2.30 to cover the assessment of noncompliance with laws and regulations. We'll again take a short break and reconvene from 3 to 5 to conclude our day with the economic impact of the proposed standard. Each time we break, you may rejoin using the same link. The purpose of the roundtable, again, is for staff to obtain the perspectives of our panelists on specific aspects of the NOCLAR proposal. Additional background on the topics and questions to be covered during today's roundtable is available in the staff briefing docu document, mm -hmm. which is on the, the event page. You will find link to the home page of the PCOB's website for the entirety of today's meeting. With that, let's get started on our first panel on identification. It will be organized into two topics. Topic one, the threshold for the identification of laws and regulations, and topic two, direct illegal acts versus indirect illegal acts. We have 10 distinguished panelists joining us today. Uh, D. Keith Bell, a Senior Vice President of Finance for the Travelers Companies, 
Douglas Carmichael, the Claire and Eli Mason Professor, Baruch College, CUNY. John Coates from the John F. Kogan Jr. Professor of Law and Economics, Harvard Law School. Brian Croto, the U.S. Chief Auditor and Auditing Services Leader of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Robert J. Jackson, Jr., Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance, New York University School of Law. R. Brad Martin, Vice Chairman, FedEx Corporation, who is here as a member of an audit committee. Kyle Owens, Partner, Auditing Standards at Crow. Christian Peo, National Managing Partner of Audit Quality and Professional Practice at KPMG. Sandra J. Peters, CFA Institute Senior Head Advocacy and Regulatory Relations, and Lynn Turner, Senior Advisor at Heming Moores. You can find bi bios for each panelist on our website. Uh, today, Martin, Karthik, and I are here to listen. We will direct specific questions toward panelists in order to inform our efforts as we work toward a final recommendation for the board. We do want to hear from all panelists who wish to speak on each topic and to encourage dialogue amongst the panelists within the time allotted. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like to say something, please use the raise your hand function. If that's not work, working, just type something in the chat function. Uh, and if anyone has technical issues during the roundtable, please reach out to Brian Goodnaw. In the event we run out of time, we welcome all panelists to submit additional comments to the comment file. Thank you in advance for your patience. A note to those watching online, panelists were asked to submit any new data or analysis they plan to present here today to the comment file ahead of today's meeting. And I believe we have several submissions that are available. To ensure all panelists have time to speak, we won't be able to accommodate slide presentations from individual panelists, but nonetheless, we encourage panelists to refer to the submissions in the file. So let's dive into topic one, the threshold for identification of laws and regulations. As part of planning and performing an audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement, the proposed standard would require auditors to identify laws and regulations with which noncompliance could reasonably have a material effect on the financial statements. As part of the proposal, the auditor would identify such laws and regulations based on information obtained from risk assessment procedures and other procedures performed during the audit of the financial statements, reviews of inter interim financial information, and if applicable in an audit of internal control, over financial reporting. The proposal explained that the phrase could reasonably have a material effect would tailor the proposed requirements to include those laws and regulations that relate to the way matters are recorded or disclosed in the financial statements, along with other laws and regulations that would relate to the operations of a company with which the company's noncompliance could reasonably result in material penalties, fines, or damages. These laws and regulations would necessarily be relevant to the company or its operations, but would not represent every law or regulation to which the company is subject. Our first question is, are there other thresholds besides could reasonably have a material effect that would provide sufficient rigor to the auditor's identification of laws and regulations relevant to the audit of the company's financial statements. I'd like to begin by giving the floor to the representatives from the audit firms. Uh, let's start in the order of Mr. Croto, Mr. Peo, and Mr. Owens. Well, thanks, thanks Barb, and, and, and to the board and staff. I really appreciate the opportunity, first of all, to be here, and um, more importantly, uh, commend the PCOB uh, for holding the roundtable and, and public outreach. I know many commenters, including my firm and, and, and myself, thought that it was important uh, for you to do this. And, and, you know, as I prepared for today and I reflected on reading many comment letters that you've received of the over 140, um, I had a number of conversations across kind of all constituents to try to understand where we are here relative to the threshold and where we are relative to kind of the misunderstanding that I think might exist uh, among con constituents. And I, I do think, Barb, the threshold's an important place to start the discussion. Um, I guess what I would say is, is as I, I reflect again on what investors are asking for, I think there may be some misunderstanding relative to what we do today. And I also think that the proposal as written uh, can be read in a variety of ways that, that you know, I, I can understand why there is a degree of concern. 
certainly uh, from preparers, auditors, uh, audit committees, and why investors might might be reading it differently to suggest that they're just asking for something that's very reasonable. So to try to reconcile all that, at least as I think about it, um, you know, Barbara, I thought it might be helpful to kind of describe a little bit of, of how we think about or how you could think about the threshold. Um, as you think about laws and regs today that we focus on relative to preparation of financial statements in our role as auditors, I sort of start at the center relative to those that are directly uh, related to the preparation of the financial statements and directly affect accounts and disclosure, so like tax law and pension. I don't think anyone's suggesting today that we remove the reasonable assurance requirements relative to uh, compliance with those laws and appropriate preparation of financial statements and auditors' responsibilities around those. Whether, whether you call that direct, whether you call it something else, we can all debate what the what the right words are around that, but I don't, I don't think you want to move away from reasonable assurance. Then you get to the next set of laws and regs and, and, and as we think about it, or as I think about it. And for those, these are ones that I think about as being central to the company's operations. And this could relate to the EPA or you know, FDA, it could relate to, um, you know, from a banking perspective, anti-money laundering. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of laws and regs that we and companies spend a lot of time on today and I don't know that that's come through relative to an understanding of the current standard. And I also think the proposal is probably meant to focus on a lot of those laws and regs that are in fact central. And you know, when you think about the company's obligations today relative to ICFR, but relative to ASC 450 or the appropriate accounting standards given their financial reporting framework, I think we've not talked enough about what's done today and what could be done to enhance that today. Um, but for those that think it's out of scope, if it's not direct, I think there's a misunderstanding. It's not, these laws are not out of scope. No laws and regs are out of scope if we become aware of a violation that could be, uh, have a material effect on the financial statements. So that's sort of the next set of laws and regs that I think about. And, and by the way, to evidence that, we have CAMs today related to some of those laws and regs and the accruals and disclosures related to them. You'll find several uh, related to FDA, Federal Trade Commission. And so, clearly not out of scope, focused on today, a lot of time spent by auditors. Then you think about, well, everything else. What are the rest of the laws and regs that perhaps the company doesn't have as robust compliance monitoring around, um, and perhaps much less likely to lead to material misstatement of the financial statements? And I think there, um, certainly CFA and, and uh, the investor advisory group letters do suggest a different threshold relative to thinking about those and, and moving kind of from could to, to, to would or is likely. Um, and I think that would help. But I think the trouble is when you get to those kinds of laws and regs, and, and, and when you think about what those could be, you could think about, you know, uh, and it's going to depend whether, you know, how, how relevant it is depending on the, the industry that we're speaking about. But it could be, for instance, from a banking perspective, the timeliness of responding to garnishment uh, requests or, you know, OSHA violations, potential for OSHA violations that don't have a direct material effect on the company's operations. When you get to those types of laws and regs, and not to suggest that they're not important, but when you get to those laws and regs that are you know, a lot less likely to have a material effect on the financial statements, I think you need to be cautious about how much you're asking management and auditors to spend time from a financial reporting perspective, trying to identify the full set of those laws around the world. And then, and then importantly, separating that discussion from detection. And the detection discussion to me is important to both the categories I described, whether it be those you're already focused on, whether it be EPA, for example, we don't sit at the river to see if the company dumps in another site, if they already have a Superfund site, certainly there are questions we may ask, but but detection of laws and uh, violations of laws and regs is another important distinction that needs to be made. So that's a bit of a long answer to your question to suggest that I think the current threshold in the standard, uh, in the proposal, I should say, um, clearly is too low, and I think acknowledged by the IAG uh, letter as well as CFA and others, um, and 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 many comment commenters. So I think clearly too low, but also doesn't think carefully enough about. Um, detection of illegal acts and, and what the role is relative to detection and how far one goes to identifying the full set of laws and regs. So in my view, it, whether you focus on direct and indirect going forward or something else, 
I think those are kind of the, 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 the categories of laws and regs that I would think about. I think you could start with the threshold proposed by, by for instance, IAG and, and, and CFA, but I, I think you need more than that relative to the concepts that I, I just described. So, uh, you know, probably can say a lot more about that, but the last thing I'll say, Barb, is that, you know, some have commingled the fraud within this discussion and like direct effect compliance with laws and regs that I mentioned, like pensions and, 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 and um, taxes, fraud, we already have reasonable assurance requirements around relative to financial statement reporting and, and, and misappropriation of assets. I wouldn't confuse that in this discussion today either. I think we're talking about incremental violations of laws and regs. Your risk assessment standards do a great job today with all the work that you've done relative to addressing fraud throughout the audit and the auditor's responsibilities. So I wouldn't wanna confuse what I'm saying here relative to the next sets of laws and regs as you get beyond those that have a direct effect um, relative to fraud. So um, that may not be the, you may have been looking for something more succinct, but that's how I think about it, Barbara. Thank you, Brian, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Payo? Sure. Uh, I'll probably give an answer that's fairly similar to Brian's, uh, but maybe expound on a few points. Um, maybe I'll start by also thanking uh, the board and OCA. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel and to uh, further explore this really important topic. It doesn't surprise me that Brian, when he answered your question, went uh, directly to what might be your second part of the of the panel, which is direct versus indirect, because I think that that threshold that you asked the question about really does matter um, if there is no more distinction between direct and indirect. So Brian did a really nice job describing uh, how the standards and how the, the uh, profession thinks about no car today with direct and indirect. Maybe I'll just offer a couple of other thoughts on there to support what Brian's saying. What may be a little bit misunderstood is um, just because we divide between direct and indirect does not mean that as auditors, we completely ignore violations related to indirect, uh, violations that might have an indirect impact on the financial statements. In fact, we, once the issues are identified, we do the exact same work uh, for the most part. I, I can't think of a difference that we would do whether we discovered a direct, a, a uh, instance of non-compliance that relates to or that has a direct impact on the financial statements or one that has an indirect impact on the financial statements. And so the issue really uh, that is a concern to the profession the way that the standard is written uh, is about how much work are you supposed to do over the indirect versus the direct. The direct, we uh, already have to do a whole bunch of work. We have to provide reasonable assurance over that. And on the indirect, to me, it's a matter of at what point do the auditors get involved? And so some of the language that is used in the standard, uh, paragraph six, for example, where it says that the auditor has to understand management's process related to identifying the laws and regs, but then also preventing identifying, investigating, evaluating, communicating. The example that Brian used, I think he said um, that we would have to uh, conceivably sit at at the waterfront to see if if uh, folks are, if companies are actually um, violating EPA regs. That, that's probably not too far of an exaggeration. I don't know if he was trying to exaggerate to make a point, but um, when you start talking about, well, the, we're going to have the auditors do work to prevent indirect uh, 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 compliance violations that may have an indirect impact on the financial statements, that's when we start to get into things that are far outside of financial reporting and into the other slice of the COSO cube, or one of the other slices of the COSO cube, and into compliance. And, and that's where I think that uh, the profession really is asking the PCOB to be very thoughtful about whether you want us to go that far. That I think is, a, is uh, something that we've not done. Uh, that is something that would be uh, uh, very, uh, a very significant scope change for us. 
And uh, then back to your original question, Barb, uh, that that threshold question, I think, on um, could reasonably have an impact really only comes into play if you're asking us to uh, identify those laws and regulations that would have an indirect impact as opposed to what we do today, which is we do a lot of procedures and a lot of those procedures relate to trying to identify uh, non-compliance, whether it's direct or indirect, but it starts a little bit further downstream than where the proposal would ask us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Owens, um, in the interest of time, and I know, I know it's hard to talk about some of these issues without getting into everything. If we could just focus though, um, your remarks on the threshold in particular, so I can make sure that we get to all of our panelists. Sure, Barb, um, definitely appreciate being here today. Um, with respect directly to uh, the threshold question here, um, we, we do um, appreciate the intent of the language selected here that could reasonably language to appropriately tailor the proposed requirements of focus on the laws and regs that relate to the way the matters are presented and disclosed in the financial statements. But we do share some of the same concerns that are being highlighted in the briefing paper. Um, specifically, the, the auditors would need to identify a complete population of laws and regulations before determining which laws and regs could reasonably have a material effect on the financial statements. We also share the same concern um, that the requirement is overly broad. Um, and a little bit of background there um, for, for those views. Um, in, the proposed, in the proposal, paragraph two of the proposed requirements states that with respect to all laws and regulations, the statement of the financial statements can arise when violations occur and are, are not properly presented in the financial statements. Given that a misstatement of the financial statements can arise with the violation of any law that is not presented in the financial statements, we believe for an auditor to complete an assessment of which laws and regs could reasonably have a material effect, the auditor would need to start with that complete listing and be able to assess which laws and regs could reasonably have a material effect on the financial statements. For example, the auditor would need to understand the nature of the potential contingent monetary effects, such as the fines, the penalties, the damages or the provisions for the allowance for returns. And to make this assessment, an auditor may need to obtain a specialist, potentially multiple specialists to assist in understanding the nature and the range of the potential non-compliance and the range of the potential contingent monetary effects. So we believe that the auditor would need to identify a complete population of all the regulations um, in that because of this, the proposal is going to be overly broad because we believe it's going to be challenging to eliminate any law regulation uh, under the could res reasonably threshold. So I, I guess maybe the best way, Barb, for um, to kind of think about some of this, I thought I'd take maybe through a quick example here. Um, as you know, we do audit a number of banking institutions and banking institutions not only has to comply with all the laws and regs of any entity, but also with the federal and state banking laws. And so if we just focus on those federal and state banking laws for this particular example, from a federal perspective, you can go out to uh, your favorite law library, search for you know, the federal finance and banking statutes, and the results are gonna be numerous. You're gonna have the Bank Secrecy Act, the Community Reinvestment Act, Equal Credit Opportunity, Electronic Funds Transfer Act, Fair Credit Act, Fair Debt Collections, Fair Housing Act, and a number of other uh, laws and regulations before you even get to the state banking laws. So in our view, under the proposed standard, the auditor would need to start with this complete listing and essentially begin an elimination process that is make a determination of whether the law or reg could reasonably have a material effect on the financial statements. And to be able to do so, the auditor would need to understand the law and regulation and all the applicable requirements. But if I kind of take that one step further, um, and focus on anti money money laundering laws. If I could pause, I mean, we're we're not we're not trying to focus as much on what was in the proposal, but what what it could be. Do, do you have any other suggestions for what a different threshold work? Do you have any suggestions there? 
So I think from call it the recommendations on the threshold, it's more about not necessarily call it the threshold, but the factors about how you think about what laws and regulations would be in play from the overall audit perspective. So what are the additional factors of how an auditor can eliminate any potential laws or reg regulations or better make that overall risk assessment that a law and regulation would not have or could not have a material effect on a financial statement. So I think it's more about the application of how you would apply any threshold um, for this particular analysis. But if I could ask you, we'll come back to that because I think our last question in the panel get gets to that really specifically, and I want to make sure we all have something to say by the time we get there. Thank you so much, Mr. Owens. If um, I'd now like to call on three other panelists, may maybe to react in part to what you just heard, um, Mr. Coates, Mr. Jackson, Ms. Peters, and, and Mr. Turner in that order. Um, you know, we heard some things about the threshold. Um, including references to the, to those suggested in comment letters from the CFA Institute and our investor advisory group. Uh, I know you're not on on camera yet. Uh, we'll give you another second. But Mr. Coates, I want to see if you had any response first to what you've heard so far today. Um, thank you, Barbara. Thank you to the board for the invitation. Um, um, recognize I'm not an accountant or an auditor, and so come at this from a law background. Um, I, so I, I have some sympathy for the general idea that the could reasonably standard has the potential for creating confusion and, uh, depending on your take on it could lead to the approach that Kyle was just sketching that the sense would be list every law, list every penalty go through an elaborate item by item elimination. So I, I, I take the general point um, that other language might be useful. I, I would, I, my own sense of it would be there are existing um, kinds of words in the ASC's MDNA or in 450, ASC 450, that I think could be applied. It's not going to be a, a straight apples to apples because, of course, those are settings that you're taking specific facts and specific risks or specific contingencies. Here, this is at a higher level, but the same kind of language would then lead to a more well understood idea about what gets above the, so reasonably possible from ASC 450. Uh, you know, people still disagree about exactly what that is, but it's, you know, certainly more than 10% chance of a material impact on, et cetera. And I think with that alone, the kind of work that Kyle's sketching could be dramatically reduced in terms of the cost and challenge. I also think um, it's, it, it, um, let me echo the idea that we might circle or the board might circle back to this threshold question after being a little bit more clear with itself and out loud with commenters about what precisely are the on the ground changes in conduct that that, that are desirable, because that then might help inform how to think about the framing of the general language. Let me let me say one other very general thing just to level set no lawyer ever has known all the laws like no one has ever done the list that kyle was suggesting like it, it would be a crazy list to imagine any full-time professional lawyer doing even an academic even if that was their sole job they still would never get done because the law would change too fast to get to the end of the list um, much less the list of penalties etc so like l let's maybe get a little realistic about um on both sides of the aisle here that is those are wanting the, the proposal to change and also those of you who are proposing it about like what meaningfully actually could be done in practice. There's also related to that, and this will be the last thing I say, <clears throat> identification in a general way actually could be done very simply, like I, that is with a relatively short list. So instead of each of the specific statutes and regulations that Kyle was beginning to list out, you could just simply frame it as laws generally applicable to banks. All right, we've now identified them. Uh, and then there are laws generally applicable to every entity. And then there are laws, I mean, so depending on the specificity of the exercise, 
the threshold could be more or less easily met, um, even as currently written. So, but I, but I, I, I want to circle back to, to land that. I still think drawing on existing language frameworks that are more well understood would, would be something I would suggest um, the board consider. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Jackson? Well, thank you, Barb. And I want to uh, join my uh, fellow panelists in congratulating and thanking you, the board, and others. Um, I, you know, I agree with Brian Croteau. Uh, uh, putting this roundtable together is exactly the kind of thing that the board should be doing and reaching out to practitioners who are going to have to implement these standards. Um, and I want to um, uh, begin just by um, offering a caveat or two. And then, Barb, I'm just going to make two points um, because I know we have a lot to cover this morning. Um, so first, I want to say um, uh, apologies in advance. Um, those of you who, um, uh, who might be familiar with my background, I was a commissioner on the SEC um, uh, with board member Kara Stein um, a few years ago, and I stepped down to have uh, to have kids. Um, and Barb, I succeeded. Like I hit my performance targets. I have two kids. Um, uh, bonus is still in the mail. Um, but uh, but unfortunately, what that means is that I have uh, a two and a half year old who is uh, a little under the weather. Um, so uh, I may have to drop off in the panel uh, to take him to a doctor's appointment. If I have to do that, I promise it's not because uh, I'm not dying to hear more about NOCLAR, um, but because I'm required to. Uh, I'm required to, at first. Second, my corporate law professor was John Coates. Um, so any mistakes I make are his fault. Um, so if I say anything in the next three minutes that seem wrong to you, um, uh, you, uh, you should email John. Uh, okay, so, so two things I want to say today. Um, first of all, I'm, I, I want to uh, thank Brian and Christian for what I thought were very thoughtful comments uh, about this proposal. Um, and, and the reaction that I have is that there's really good news this morning, uh, which is that there is some agreement uh, about the kind of work that auditors should be doing in this space. The question is what work and when? Um, and that's why this conversation, I think, is so important and I think will be so valuable. I hope will be so valuable uh, to the board and to the profession. And again, I only have two points to make about it. The first point I want to make, and I, I'm directing this to, to, to Karthik and Martin in particular and others um, in the field who will consider the costs and benefits of this proposal, which is I want folks to be thoughtful about the baseline. So what additional work uh, does this new standard really impose? That's the question we should be asking from a cost and benefit analysis. And you just heard from Christian and Brian that there's existing work that happens in the space. In fact, 10 cap A has required a great deal, um, uh, a, a great deal of auditor work in this area for some time. And I want to point out that that's the appropriate baseline on which any further work would be building. Um, so just to give you an example, um, my son, as I say, he's two and a half. He thinks I'm very tall. Now, those of you who've met me know he's wrong. His problem, the mistake he's making, is that he uh, doesn't have a good baseline for measurement. Um, he doesn't know that many people, so he is persuaded that someone who's five, seven on a good day is tall, but he's wrong because he, what he should do is look at the broader population, all the thing, all the people, and then he could see whether dad is really tall. And sadly, he would discover the answer is no. Similarly here, when you're measuring cost and benefits, we should start from the existing baseline which is that auditors already do considerable work under 10 cap A. It's true, I think, and clear, as Brian and Krishna have both suggested, that what's been proposed, especially some of the ambiguity in the language, adds something. But the baseline is not zero, for the same reason I'm not tall. Um, that is, there's an existing set of um, uh, work that's already happening. There are other people in the world who are taller. And for that reason, um, uh, the economic analysis should, uh, should focus on that distinction rather than um, uh, pretending as if you're building on nothing because the board is not doing that first. Second, I want to forcefully agree with what Professor Coates has said. It may just be that he taught me the law, but um, I think he's right, and I want to be more specific about it. My own view uh, is that there is a lot to be gained for the board from drawing from language from the SEC's rules governing management discussion and analysis of financial statements. You all might remember that the year after the famous Basic versus Levinson case was decided in 1988, that's the materiality case, the very next year in 1989, the SEC put out a release and said, when you're doing MDNA, that's not the standard. When you're writing things like risk factors or doing management discussion, giving context to the financial statements, the standard for whether to say something about something in the financial statements is not the probability magnitude test of BASIC, because then you'd have to disclose things of very low probability. No, no. The SEC said that uh, the standard is reasonably likely to have a material effect. 
And I think that concept borrowed here could do real work in addressing some of the concerns you heard from Brian and Krishna and others, because um, uh, for the following reason, existing disclosure committees at issuers are familiar with that standard, interact with audit committees and others about the implementation and approach of that standard, and laws that are reasonably likely to have a material effect on the issuer are going to be the subject of other uh, conversations about disclosure elsewhere in the document. For that reason, um, using that as a basis to focus and narrow auditors' work in this area, um, I think might be worth considering. So I want to suggest, as others have in the comment file, that using that MDNA standard as a way to um, weed out the long list of laws that, as John Coates says, no real law no lawyer knows, um, might be a path forward here that, um, that folks should talk about today, because if it's one that practitioners in law and accounting feel they can apply, it might be a way to make this standard as effective as possible for investors. Uh, thanks again, Barb, for having me today. I'm delighted to have the chance to, to share my thoughts. Thank you, and I and understand if you have to step away. Um, Ms. Peters, any reaction to either what's been said or anything you wanted to share? Well, a lot has been said. It's hard to <clears throat> summarize that all very quickly. I think that the, the, um, the, the second question in the, the second topic about what's done today, which is where Brian started and some of the others, is really um, <clears throat> um, something that I think is very important because I think what we're trying to resolve here is an expectation gap between what investors expect of an audit and what actually happens in an audit. And it is, it is, it is actually why investors think audits are very valuable, but audit reports are not necessarily value because there's a lack of transparency with respect to what's actually communicated, right? Auditor investors don't read auditing standards. And they don't, they don't know that there's a, diff, a distinction between direct and indirect that was written into the profession some 35 years ago that scopes things out that they might, that they might care about. And our members told us in a survey maybe five years ago that NOCLAR was one of the top three things that they wanted um, the standard setters to consider because noncompliance with laws and recu um, regulations and the resulting consequences um, on the reputation and financial statements can be quite um, significant. But I think that there's um, a very, um, in, in thinking about this panel, there's what's management's responsibility. Um, and under 302, they need to make sure that there's not a material mission in the financial statements. There's auditors and, and they need to comply with the accounting for contingencies under ASC 450. Auditors have, have um, responsibilities under Sarbanes-Oxley. They have responsibilities under the auditing standards. They have responsibilities under Section 10A. They are quite so clear in what, or in, from an investor perspective, on making sure there's no gap on the omission of a material misstatement in the financial statements related to a non-compliance with regulations. That's the gap we're trying to, as investors, um, solve, right? And so we, in our comment letter, um, we said, well, maybe it could be is reasonably expected, or I forget exactly the exact word we use. But in reflecting on that, you know, if you look at AS 2110, it uses, when it, and, and AS 2110 is identifying and assessing risks of material misstatement, uses could it uses the exact same language right so how do we use different language here than in the statement with respect to material misstatements and we have sympathy with respect to the fact that investors don't want auditors to one build a list of all the laws and they don't they don't want um i mean investors have to pay for all of this right so they don't want met um auditors to do things that management isn't responsible for doing first. They want to review what management has done. We are, investors want um, auditors to look at what management's done in a skeptical way and assess whether or not management has actually made an, um, a reasonable assessment of that there's no um, material misstatement of the financial statements from a non-compliance with laws and regulations. If management doesn't have a complete list, but has a process that's reasonable, I think that's something that we want auditors to look at. And it may require they use legal expertise. They do it already when they have to, if they 
if they come upon something, they already have to evaluate it. We're just asking in using, and they'll need to use legal expertise in doing that. We're saying, are you looking at the process for identifying these items and the potential misstatement that may occur? And maybe you need to use legal expertise on that. But we're not coming to we're not coming to this issue saying you need to look at every law and regulation and you need to do it before management does, does it or separate and apart from management. We look at paragraph six and say we it says you should work use the work of management. Um, I think I think it's it's the language in paragraph four that says identify laws and regulations. Um, it's really the identify even more so than the could, and maybe some merging of the language in paragraph 4A and 4B um, could be a possible way, and I won't do that here, of, of saying we would, we as investors want auditors to ensure there's no material misstatement from the of the financial statements from noncompliance with rules and regulations, but that doesn't include looking at every single law. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Uh, Mr. Turner? I think you're on mute. Apologize for that. So it's actually been 45 years ago when the profession adopted this notion of indirect and direct. And since that time, we've had the FCPA passed. We've had Section 10A, of which I had a role in drafting, adopted. We've had SOX passed, including the whistleblower provisions and ethics. And we've had a federal court ruling from the bench that auditors are responsible for detecting fraud. So there's a real basis here for, and, and it's most appropriate that the PCLB would at this point in time come back and revisit which, uh, that which is a very outdated uh, standard. Uh, I do think that uh, the notion of could reasonably have a material effect is a proper standard. Uh, John, uh, you mentioned you're not an auditor, and Rob, <clears throat> I don't think you are either, in all due respect. But the notion of could possible is a well understood auditing notion. It is the exact language that's already used for auditors in the standard that says you have to go out and assess risk uh, of a potential material misstatement. So that language is well understood by the auditing profession, you know, probably as well understood as basic in TSC is by the attorneys. And so it's not this confusing language for auditors at all. In fact, if auditors don't understand that, we've actually got a much bigger problem than in this instance. Now, the IAG, in reading the comment letters from the various firms, uh, saw the concern that um, they were, uh, felt that pe perhaps people wouldn't understand it. I don't think there's any question auditors can uh, understand that. On the other hand, given their concern, we had uh, a great discussion at the IAG about this, and the IAG, and I certainly don't speak for the group as a whole, but they agreed we'd insert the reasonably likely language that John uh, you and Rob mentioned that came out of the 1989 releases by the commission. I was actually at the commission when that came out. But when you look at the guidance that the uh, commission gave as the language reasonably likely, and it's in the footnote of our comment letter, and, and 
it was incorrect for Brian to categorize the IAG letter as setting a higher standard than could reasonably possible. That's just not true. In fact, if you look at the comment letter, it says, and quotes the commission, says, note that reasonably likely is a lower threshold than more likely than not, but higher than remote, which means it ain't gonna happen. So reasonably likely is someplace in between, uh, it ain't gonna happen, and it's less than 50-50. And that is nothing short of could, uh, could reasonably have a material effect. It's the same thing. And personally, I don't care if you write in the word glad or you write in the word happy. And that's what we're talking about here. Do you put in could possibly have an, a, a material impact using language that auditors already use every day of the year and clearly understand or to help others out do we turn around and use language reasonably likely? They're the both, they are both the same threshold. Anyone that can pull out a Webster's will see that they're both the same. So what we're talking about here and what we're arguing about is do we write glad or do we write happy? And quite frankly, I think there's more important things to spend our time on than uh, uh, that. So, uh, certainly, I agree with Sandy that there's a role here for the auditors. There's a role here for management. Uh, any final standard should highlight the importance of the controls and processes that management, including the GC and CFO and CEO have in place. And, and the auditors, to the extent that they can test those processes and controls, then certainly they don't have to do everything all over again. They can rely upon that information. Of course, if management doesn't have any process for identifying uh, these uh, non-compliance situations that could have a material impact, then uh, the auditor's gonna have to, to, to do more because they're providing reasonable, a high level of assurance to investors that there's no material misstatement. They're also saying in their audit report, in every audit report that goes out, they say, we have performed an audit that was designed to uh, ensure that there's no material misstatements, whether from errors or fraud. Fraud is an illegal act the last time I looked. And, and there's no footnote hanging off that saying, except for indirect. So the notion of direct and, uh, uh, indirect and direct is outdated, needs to go by the wayside. We need to get everyone focused on singularly on is this thing having a material impact? Because if it's having a material impact, even if you might've called it indirect in the past, say OSHA or say account openings, like what transpired at Wells Fargo, even if you were trying to say that's not uh, material, and it turns out to be, you got a problem. And that is a, a issue that the PCLB is rightfully trying to uh, address here. So stay focused where you are, I'd say. If it's material, it doesn't matter whether it's direct or indirect. To argue that, oh, because it's indirect, I don't have to worry about it. No, that's not the issue. You're an auditor and you're telling everyone there's no material misstatement in those financial statements. So if it's indirect, but still has a material impact and you haven't done your job assessing the risk and testing and identifying that, you got a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I see two hands up, but just to, uh, I wanna make sure we hear everyone speak. Um, and so I'll come back to you, but, but Mr. Bell and Mr. Martin, I mean, as an issue or an audit committee member, you grapple with threshold issues and you, you grapple with when instances of no, non-compliance need to be recorded or disclosed. Um, any any response or, or views on this? And then I'll circle back to, to Doug Carmichael after you. Mr. Bell? Sure, in dissecting this question, my first reaction is there's a couple issues. Um, this question is based on the premise that the auditor should have a broader responsibility in identifying the applicable laws and regulations. 
I don't necessarily agree with that premise as it's really management's responsibility to identify the laws and regulations with it, which it must comply and then to put in place appropriate um, procedures and controls to fulfill that responsibility. It's really the auditor's responsibility to assess the effectiveness and completeness of those process and controls is not to duplicate them. And I think my biggest concern here is that auditors really shouldn't be placed in the position of performing management's responsibilities, um, which in this case would require skills outside of their training and prof um, professional credentials. Also, um, I think that this proposal could require auditors or the specialists to replicate management's efforts and at a level that's not likely to be at the same depth as management's to obtain um, evidentiary matter, to review internal documentation and communications, to do uh, legal research and interview management. This approach gets pretty close to impairing the auditor's independence, and we believe that imposing these responsibilities creates a high risk of misleading investors that the auditors provided a greater level of assurance it also implies that the auditor has a shared responsibility in the preparation of the financial statements, which is not true, and it significantly increases the cost and risk of delay of an audit. On the issue, sorry, uh, I was going to say on the issue of um, the threshold, I was listening to the comments on reasonably likely versus reasonably possible. I think they are different thresholds. Um, reasonably possible to me implies that uh, a higher or excuse me a lower um, possibility of occurring than reasonably likely the word likely implies that it's going to happen so i think there is a distinction there but i think a better approach would be to go back and look at the uh, tsc industries case where it uses the term uh, substantial likelihood that a reasonable shareholder would consider an important fact I think that's a better threshold. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I, I know people may want to respond to some things. We do have a question specifically on how the auditor might be able to use the work of the company. So if we could maybe table comments on that. Um, Mr. Martin and then Mr. Carmichael. Uh, thank you very much. I'll add just two or three things. I am neither an attorney or an accountant, so I can add very little value to the specific issues that are being discussed today, but we'll comment in two or three respects. Number one is a chairman of an audit committee that is an issuer and vice chairman of its board. We're gonna play by whatever rules that it is the PCAOB outlines and work uh, with our audit firms. I've been on 11 public company boards. I've chaired four audit committees uh, and have had a significant interaction when our audits have been audited by the PCAOB, so I have enormous respect for the process. But I would say to Mr. Coates' comment and Mr. Bell's comment, what's going on on the ground from my perspective at an audit committee and at a board it is a very serious focus of the tone at the top of the corporation, the resources and processes in place and controls in place to assure compliance uh, with laws and regulations, and a transparent communication among management, board, and the auditors when there are issues arising associated with that. That's the standard by which we've operated everywhere that I've been involved with uh, a company. I've signed 302s as a CEO of a, a big enterprise, and on the ground, that's my perspective of what happens day in, day out. I don't speak for FedEx, but I will tell you that FedEx has 500 staff attorneys focused on complying with the laws and regulations uh, of, of a company that operates in 220 different jurisdictions. I will tell you, we have a compliance function that is intensely focused on compliance. Our board, our audit committee, we meet regularly with all of the constituents that are involved in compliance and oversight and financial reporting transparency. So. Uh, whatever it is we're trying to solve for here, I'm not really familiar with being neither an attorney or an accountant. I interact with and have interacted with as chairman or CEO or a lead director, hundreds of investors. Not once has it been raised to me. This is a very important gap, if you will, on the ability to assess 
uh, how a company is performing for those who own it. It will cost money from those who own it. Uh, it will slow certain processes down. Not sure what value it will add, but I do respect the uh, the important mission of PCAOB and its work with the audit firm to try to get to the right place to ensure even more confidence in everything that we're trying to do. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. Mr. Carmichael? Uh, yes, I've been uh, thinking about this subject since 1973. Uh, so I have a lot uh, of comments, but I'll confine them here to uh, the issue we're supposed to address. Uh, words, I think, are extremely important. I think it would be better to bring the language closer to what auditors are familiar with. To uh, So I would endorse what Professor Coates said, reasonably possible as defined in uh, FASB ASC 45020, because auditors are familiar with applying that. They apply it not only to loss contingencies uh, all the time, but also in evaluating material weaknesses in ICFR. Um, material effect is fine, but I think it would be a lot better to use the conventional material misstatement of the financial statements, recognizing that material misstatement includes material omissions. I think bringing that language closer on those two points to what auditors are already familiar with would uh, solve some of the issues. Thank you so much. Um, let, let me call on the hands that are raised before we move on to another question. I so appreciate everyone's input. Uh, Mr. Croto, I believe you had your hand up first. Thanks, thanks, Barb. I think this is a great discussion relative to the threshold. I did want to comment just because Lynn had suggested a difference of view on, on, on the threshold. Just to be clear, I wasn't, I, I didn't make any comparison to likely and possible. There's clarity in my mind as the different, the difference between those. And, and, and in light of Doug's comment, I, I, I think either could be, could be models to think about here. I was focused on the word is versus could, um, which, is a, which is an important distinction, and, and it's in both the IAG letter and in uh, the CFA letter as rec a recommendation, which, which I was just trying to anchor to as an example of something that I think we could be supportive of, provided there's additional uh, criteria that go with it. And, and I don't think anyone's really talked about Another point that Christian and I, for example, raised relative to the detection of violations of some of these laws. I don't think Sandy, actually Sandy did in fairness, I think. And, and, and I don't think investors are expecting us to monitor that the company is complying with these laws. Certainly, certainly we may become aware and there's a lot that we do to become aware, but when you use thresholds like reasonably likely or reasonably possible if you're talking about the detection that's a compliance audit and and i think that's an important distinction for example when the sec wanted for broker dealers a compliance audit over laws and regs they didn't say over all laws and regs that broker dealers are responsible for they picked a few customer statement reserve net capital the ones that matter the most that's a lot of work to do the audit to detect compliance issues, which is different than the things we might do as auditors in terms of risk assessment and procedures to become aware. And, and when you think about that, it's not just factors. I think you probably want to outline some of the procedures you would expect auditors to perform. One example of those procedures that's not in PCOB standards today, we, we have it in our own policies and, I, and it's in other, other standards. Um, is one around reviewing legal expenses that companies pay to make sure that we think about legal letters we're sending, inquiries we're making, because that helps inform us as to whether there could be violations of laws or regulations that we're not aware of, but the company's working with legal counsel on. So thinking about those kinds of things, I think is important, but it's gotta be procedural based for detection of noncompliance. And I think even identification of certain laws and regs beyond those that are central to the operations. And so that's why once you get beyond those that are you know, directly related to the financial statements and financial reporting, I think robust risk assessment and other procedures is the right way to be thinking about that. But the threshold that we're describing, you know, I think, I think you know, we, we could certainly live with and work with, 
Um, not the one that's in the proposal, but the one that's in the IG letter or even one that's based on reasonably possible. But I wasn't, to Lynn's question, I was not, I, I know the difference between those two and was not, was, was not debating that threshold difference. Thank you, Mr. Croto. Mr. Payo, and then Mr. Coates. I think you're on mute. Uh, Mr. Payo, you're on mute. Crying out loud, sorry. Mr. Lynn on the mute button. Um, I think uh, this might be a little bit repetitive to what Brian just said, but I think it'll. I'll, I'll have a few additional points here. So I do like what a lot of folks are saying. I love the concept that Sandy talked about, which is, you know, we really need to make sure we understand and can. Um, you know, reduce the expectation gap that investors have here. Maybe one of the points that I would make again is we actually do a lot of work over indirect. So the direct versus indirect threshold, um, Lynn suggested that it was time for that to go by the wayside. That that could be, I, I don't think so, but that could be, and that's certainly what the proposal says. But the reason that that direct versus indirect threshold is there is because that is a way for uh, the auditors to understand, uh, sort of provide a boundary for when does it relate to financial reporting and when does it tip over into compliance, the detection that Brian's talking about in those compliance audits. And you know the, the folks that I talk to, um, they don't want us to do compliance audits so, but the wording in the standard as it sits, as you get rid of direct versus indirect, and as you use language like, uh, we need to understand management's process, and that includes, um, earlier in the text, it says it includes testing the controls around it, not just, not just sort of understanding the process, but actually going and testing the process, the design and implementation, and the operating effectiveness of those controls. And paragraph six says, and you have to, to test that in terms of how the company prevents non-compliance, now you are into an area where, I'll use a different example than, than some of the ones that have been used, say that OSHA, which OSHA violations can be material, there's a reasonable possibility of, of, of having material fines come out of OSHA. Do, do investors really want external auditors focused on the financial statements to go and understand management's process for um, making sure that the workplace is free of OSHA violations, that they put the signs out, that they mop, that they you know, do, do all of the important things that OSHA has. There's a lot of them though. And that is how we read the standard as it is currently written. You, and you know, like, like Doug said, words matter and We've been inspected for a long time now, and and rightly so. The inspections process has really improved quality. But what the inspections process does is it says, here's the words on this in the standard. How did you comply with this? And the only way to comply with the words as written on uh, as you move over into the compliance auditing and understanding and testing controls over how management prevents, among other things, prevents illegal acts is to go and understand those laws in great detail and then go test the controls that management has around the compliance aspect. That's that's a very significant difference. And I, I do wonder whether that's exactly where investors want us to spend our time. Thank you, Mr. Payo. I mean, it's hard to believe we're already an hour and almost 15 minutes into a two hour discussion. I do want to hear from Mr. Coates. And then what we'll do is maybe combine questions two and three, because I think we've gotten to some of that. So I'll, I'll go back to those, but let's, let's hear from Mr. Coates and then we'll, we'll turn to the next, next section. That's okay with everyone. Thank you. I just two brief um, comments on some of the follow ups. I, one thing I, I do appreciate. Um, Mr. Bell's references to the um, existing materiality standard, but I, I just want to make what I hope is sort of a non-controversial point that the, the threshold here cannot be materiality. 
because then there's no evaluation of the risk that could lead to materiality. That really was the point I thought Rob Jackson was making earlier. Um, the, if, you, if you impose materiality at the threshold, then that means there's no room for inter, any interaction or discussion or, or, or testing of management's assumptions about what might then produce. So I, I just, I have to say it has to be broader than the ultimate materiality test. I also want to make the point, the second point, the last one, is um, I think it's a good question about that was asked really, like why the need for updating? What 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 do we do? Why are we doing it all? I think, uh, Mr. Coach, you're frozen. Are you there? Okay. Well, when John rejoins, um, maybe if one of our, oh, here he is, here he is. Sorry, guys, if I, it's on my end, I don't know. Um, I, why are we doing this now? That's the question. And I, I've heard a couple things and I wanna add one. One is um, there's confusion between users of financial statements and the auditors and the auditing standard setters over what's expected. So that's, and, and part of the reason for that confusion, it seems to me, is as outlined earlier, there have been a lot of changes in what is standard for companies to be doing to detect noncompliance. And none of the existing standards reflect any guidance in with clarity about how the auditors interact with uh, internal audit as respects noncompliance with the compliance function or a compliance officer or a whistleblower program or go down the list. These are all things that emerged in the last 15 years. I think that's the single biggest reason. Um, but then the last thing I would say is let's keep in mind that some companies, and this is going to touch on the manager versus auditor role here, I, I know in principle, I completely agree, auditors should not be doing management's work, but part of the function of audit is to ask questions of management or provide information to the audit committee that allows the audit committee to ask questions that will move management beyond what their first inclination would be. So, for example, a new company company going into their worst minds should come down with a hammer on them with a massive penalty if they have no signs anywhere in the entire organization. Not one sign, not detection. You don't have a sign in one location. That's silly. But not even recognizing that OSHA has a significant penalty program is clearly going to be knowledge the auditors already have from other audits. I mean, it's just commonplace knowledge. But some managers for some new companies will not have. And so um, I, I particularly think we ought to, as we continue the discussion, keep in mind modal S&P 500 company, that's one thing, but newly created public company coming into more robust audits, that's a very different proposition for you think compliance, even with respect to clearly material risks mm -hmm. that at the end of the day will have to satisfy Kia's test about materiality uh, on the bottom line judgment or else stop. Thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, um, I'm going to try to combine questions two and three for, for topic one. Um, and I think we've heard a, a few ideas on each of this, maybe with respect to question two. Um, very interested in perspectives on, on whether auditors should be able to consider the work of the company in identifying laws and regs, and, and if so, people's views on, on how that should be done. Mr. Bell, I think, touched on that. That was very helpful. And uh, question three, and we might have heard a little bit of this as well, um, or what potential approaches this could a standard take to facilitate auditors in identifying laws and regulations, or how do we think about factors that, that drive the risk of material misstatement due to noncompliance with laws and regulations? Um, just in the event we might lose him, um, if we could start maybe with Mr. Jackson on this topic. Well, thanks so much, Barbara. And I did say a little bit about this earlier. So again, I'll, I'll be brief. We've got a lot of panelists here. And, and Lynn, I want to say you're right. Uh, I am uh, not an accountant. 
Um, uh, I won't even try to play one on TV, but I do want to try and give a helpful, um, uh, a helpful response to this question. You know, to answer the question directly, Barb, I think their um, management's work is absolutely the starting point and should be the starting point for any of these conversations. And my experience, having worked on uh, advising public company disclosure committees when I was in legal practice, um, is that that is what, um, how those committees already work. Uh, they, um, under 10 cap A, as the question itself suggests, and, and, and other existing legal provisions, auditors um, and others will be in the room asking hard questions, as John Coates suggests, about management's existing assessment. But they're going to start with management's existing assessment because I think everybody who's spoken today agrees that management has the best um, a grasp of the relevant facts and the, um, the things that are most likely to be important to investors when it comes to any question about the company, including compliance with law. The only question we're asking today is what happens next? Um, and my own view is that we have longstanding existing procedures under um, 10 cap A and other laws uh, that um, require auditors um, to um, ask hard questions about those policies and procedures, um, to push management on its assessments and, um, uh, uh, and, make, and make sure uh, that those assessments uh, reflect the facts on the grounds in a, in, a, in a way that investors can understand. So my own view is that drawing on those existing pra uh, practices um, in the profession will um, uh, is what the board should be considering doing, and that those are well established um, uh, practices. This we're not uh, we're not asking um, uh, or reinventing the wheel here. What we're trying to do instead is draw on those practices so that auditors can use management and the company's existing work on these questions. Um, uh, as the starting point for um, uh, for getting to get the uh, the analysis that investors will need. Thank you so much. Um, let me take that same the same section to Mr. Turner and then Ms. Peters and Mr. Carmichael. Uh, you know, Barb, I was as I thought about this, I thought back over the years. I was actually in a troubleshooting role for a while as a partner at the firm. And when we would get into issues like this, I'd get a call from New York and ask to go address it. And so I was thinking about what is it that I would do? I went back and read your proposal and I, uh, the proposal had, uh, I, I didn't have any problem with what was in the proposal. I thought it was sounding good. I thought it did tell the auditor that they were or, or, or could clearly rely on processes and procedures at the company. Um, so the points that have been made in that regard, I would agree with, but it's, it's not just inquiry, it's also just like with internal controls over any processes, you're gonna to need to test those and that includes going into, uh, you know, the general counsel's office and having a discussion and look at how they identify these things because they'll obviously identify some as big ticket items and others as not for us as a semiconductor company, we certainly, had a focus on patents um, at a Fortune 150 board I was on. The company had been sanctioned for illegal shipments to China, so that was a uh, focus. I ordered at a meatpacking company, and OSHA could shut them down at any minute. And you look back to J&J, &J, a very, very reputable company, the FDA was able to shut down some of their plants, which had a very material effect on the company and the financial operations because they weren't able to produce products. So it's not that, um, Brian and I had a discussion about this the other day, it's not that it's just ocean, so it's off the list. You have to look at the company and you have to start all this always with gaining an understanding of the company and the environment it operates in. And then there'll be big ticket items in the audit guides that the AICPA puts out or has put out. They often identify the big ticket legal issues for various types of companies. 
So that's all a starting point. Then you're gonna test the process. That would include the whistleblower program. You gotta get in and, and test the whistleblower. I've seen too many instances where the auditor talked to management about the accusations, but never went and interviewed the whistleblower. And, you know, that's probably problematic. It has been problematic in, in cases. But so I think there are some good processes. The other one was training. Uh, look at the training that a company does. One thing that I've looked at all the time is the DNO annual questionnaire, having served on a board. For those of us that have served on the board, we know there is some great information in the DNO questionnaire. And it doesn't take, you know, this is something that takes you not that long to go through, and it's been prepared by management and the board. Great stuff. And, and to the extent that's there, um, you can probably rely on that type of stuff because of who that goes to. So there's all these things, but they're not things that take a lot of time. And so you can go through that process, get an understanding, see if management's process is working. And if it is working, then that should impact uh, the scope of further work that you got to do. On the other hand, if you go in and you find that's not working, there is no documentation of that. Then you got some bigger issues that you'll have to respond to the uh, uh, risk and, and what that means to you as, as an auditor. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, Ms. Peters? I mean, I agree with what, I, I agree with what Lynn um, said. I mean, the, the, the real challenge for investors here is that management's responsible for these material omissions, but seemingly the auditor can't, is, is challenged to not, to audit this without making this distinction about direct and indirect. And, and, and the challenge, I mean, this is basically the procedures that Lynn are describing are really completeness assertion um, um, tests. Right? So the challenge with non-compliance with laws and regulations that investors have is that all of a sudden they, become, they go from indirect to a liability and a big one, right? And so you, it, it's, that distinction is, is, is really false. It, it, it sort of seems to be a false distinction. It, it, in reading some of the comment letters, it, it seems as though we're trying to draw the boundary of internal controls over financial reporting very narrowly, um, but that's hard to do when you're testing the completeness assertion of a liability, which is in fact what what Lynn is what Lynn is talking about. And but management is seemingly somehow doing it, and they're not making a distinction between direct and indirect per se, right? This is only a distinction that exists in an auditing standard. So I, 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 you know, in our comment letter, we said, we don't really care about the distinction between direct and indirect. We just care that the audit procedures are the same. But I think that the language is actually, as, I, as I've seen in the comment letters and I've heard it played out, I think the language is actually a barrier to the thinking about assessing the risk and identifying a material misstatement. And so I guess I'm leaning more to saying we should move that distinction and think about risk assessment related to a material misstatement of the financial statements, because investors do not know all of this, you know, direct and indirect and, you know, what's the boundary of internal controls over financial reporting versus um, the assessment of, of disclosures and omissions and material misstatements. I mean, they just don't understand all the, the nuance of that is something they don't understand and they aren't even aware of because you know i mean it's not disclosed there's nothing on the contingencies footnote that says well we we got everything that was direct but not the indirect or in the audit opinion it says we didn't get everything that was indirect we didn't look at everything that could be indirect right so in the end if we need to create a scope exclusion in the opinion then maybe that's what we need to do to clarify and have investors ask more um, questions about this, which might actually clarify some of the thinking. But um, to me, I agree with that management is first responsible, always responsible. I mean, the auditors cannot change a thing. They can only detect and report it, and they are incentivized not at times not to do that. 
We always want management as investors to be principally responsible. What we're asking is for the auditors to um, do a, a check on that and the audit committee um, as well. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Um, let's hear from Mr. Coates and then Mr. Carmichael, and then I'll turn back to the auditors. I, I'll be very brief on this one. It, it is absolutely clear the auditors should be able to rely on work that management is overseeing for this overall purpose. It, it, I, I don't see the value in duplication for duplication's sake. Um, some companies have very mature and robust compliance programs so that um, the idea of auditors trying to create a shadow one on, on, you know, running alongside of it clearly is just wrong. I think the devil's in the details as to exactly how much and where um, the reliance needs to be tested in the interaction. Um, how much of that can just be taken at face value? How much of it requires the auditors to do more than that? But on the basic question of reliance, absolutely yes. And that clearly will reduce the costs of whatever uh, this change may, may entail. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carmichael? Yes, I uh, certainly agree that uh, with the comments made that the auditor has to consider what management is doing, has to understand and test what management is doing this area, in this area and management's responsibility is to do it first and the auditor needs to look at it skeptically. I think it's difficult to separate issues and get started on what procedures should be done and so on without uh, specifically addressing that direct versus indirect separation that is uh, part of the questions in this session. I think uh, I was involved in both writing and developing the original SAS 17, uh, which happened in January 1977, and the uh, update in 1988, SAS 54, which is the current uh, PCAOB standard. And I think at the time, the direct versus indirect uh, concept was put into the literature. It was a bright line uh, that was understood at the time to really understate the auditor's actual responsibility. Questions did arise, uh, particularly after the update in 1988. Uh, I should say, by the way, that in both times, there was uh, also a standard on fraud detection and that received the bulk of the attention. So I, I'm glad the FASB, is, uh, the, the PCOB is focusing on this uh, because it does deserve the separate attention. I think in the past, it was overshadowed by the fraud detection SAS. But the questions that arose were uh, that really undermine that, that split be, uh, between direct and indirect disclosure. The auditor had a responsibility. The auditing standards at the time said, essentially, that the user of the financial statements can assume the disclosures are adequate unless the audit report says otherwise. Very closely related to that, uh, the accounting standards. There are standards on uh, unasserted claims and asserted claims and violations of laws and regulations fall directly into that. So if the auditor is testing conformity with GAAP, uh, the auditor has to address the FASB accounting standards uh, that deal with violations of laws and, laws and regulations, particularly those that relate to unasserted claims. Uh, unasserted claims must be disclosed in the financial statements. If uh, they are probable of assertion, and uh, the, uh, there is a uh, loss uh, reasonably possible. So um, that has to be addressed, and particularly then special industry knowledge. We in the AICPA and developing audit guides uh, got questions uh, from the committees working on the audit guides uh, about the shortcomings of SAS 54 for specialized industries. And they're just a, 
host of specialized industries, I mean, a short list, uh, mining, extractive industries, healthcare, defense contractors, foods and drugs, banks and other financial institutions, regulated operations like utilities, casinos, waste disposal, pension plans, and, and a host of others. And in all those industries, it's part of understanding the regulatory framework and the legal environment, the auditor has to understand those laws. The split uh, of uh, direct indicating what's financial reporting just doesn't work because it ignores totally the responsibilities related to financial statement disclosure, which are extremely important. And I think you know, as far as procedures, if you, I was trying to come up with ones, and I certainly endorse uh, Lynn's point that the auditor needs to uh, understand and see the, the uh, whistleblower uh, procedures that the company has and test them as to whether they are effective. That's one of the few controls that is actually mandated under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And I think auditors need to pay a lot more attention to it than they probably are right now. But the if you look at those things, disclosure, conformity with GAAP, special industry knowledge, that kind of automatically leads you into what procedures you're going to use to do those. Because you look at what what does the auditor do not do now to address those things. It just may be a small extension of those things. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Karthik, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just before we hear from the auditors, uh, and it'd be very helpful to hear what um, specific approaches they would like to see in the standard that they think would facilitate um, identification. But we, Brian very helpfully uh, said that he would prefer is or would to could. And um, uh, I just wondered if we could hear from Christian and Kyle about uh, reasonably likely and reasonably possible, whether they had any specific objections to either of those uh, would be helpful to know. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can go ahead and start here. Um, with respect to the specific threshold, I, I probably just tie it a little bit back more to maybe a comment that Sandy Peters made about merging the 4A and the 4B and thinking more about it from the auditor's responsibility to obtain an understanding of the regulatory and legal environment and then really focusing on the identification of the risk of material misstatement related to non-compliance on the financial statement. So I think from my lens, really focusing on the auditor's responsibility to identify risk of material misstatement is probably, probably where we want to focus our attention at. But again, linking up th th those concepts of reasonably possible um, would seem to make sense to me. I, I tend to agree. I, I guess I'd have to give it some thought about exact, exact words. I mean, Doug is right. Words matter. So I'd have to really think about those words and what they mean, those potential changes. But I also um, tend to agree with Lynn. I'm not sure that this is really the biggest issue that we're trying to face uh, or, or trying to, trying to um, rest, wrestle to the ground here. To me, it's really... Um, you know, the, how, how far do we go into compliance auditing? Brian, anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I, I maybe, but, uh, in, 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 I have a broader response to the other questions. Should I do both? Oh, okay. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. So maybe a few, a, a, a few things. One certainly agree with all the comments around management first. You might look to some of the words within COSO relative to existing obligations, particularly as it relates to contingencies. And, and, and you know, I think a lot has evolved since I was, um, well, I won't say how old I was, but um, I was live when all of those standards were, were, were written by Doug and others. But, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, I think you'll find some helpful words in, in, in COSO that have evolved that could be a hook relative to, to thinking about how to draft some of, some of management's existing obligations, or at least what they look to when reporting on ICFR. Um, I also think there's an important distinction, like, again, whether it's, it seems like a lightning rod. That's why I think many of us are saying, if you want to give up indirect direct, I suppose you can do that. It's, it is embedded in 10 cap A, and I don't suspect Congress is going to take it out right now. If, 
of, of 10 cap A, but I think you could even, you could still do away with it um, in, in terms of what one does after thinking about compliance. So you certainly have to follow 10 cap A. I don't think there's anything wrong with 10 cap A today. It serves its purpose and is important. Um, but but I, I, I think the more important points are, are not what you call it, direct or indirect. Christian just said it and others have said it. It's what one does relative to the laws and regs that don't directly relate to accounts and disclosures, but instead relate to ASC 450 and contingencies. And what one does around those matters because there's a very wide range. And I just wanna come back to um, points that a few have made. And you know, Lynn rattled off some examples of, of, of um, companies that have had large fines or reputational implications or, or, or otherwise. Auditors aren't going to be able to prevent companies from 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 those circumstances. There may be, um, you know, there may be a consequential um, benefit that that that's derived from this indirect benefit that's derived from this that is earlier prevention. And in some cases, maybe there's deterrent, but that auditors can't can't be expected to stop noncompliance or an illegal act from occurring. And so when you look at some of those examples, you have to think, well, from a reliable financial reporting perspective, was the, were the disclosures sufficiently timely and appropriate? And, and what was management and the auditor's role in each? And certainly the inspections function has the ability to do that. I think it's really important to use information from your inspections function. We'll get into this probably in the, in the economic analysis um, discussion, but understanding the, the, you know, the areas where you'd like to see improvement. I hate to say the problem you're solving, because when I say that, people think I'm saying there's not something to solve for. I think there's improvement to make here. Um, but but it, it, you very much have to know, are you trying to get a further identification of laws and regs that aren't already on the radar screen? Is it detection of matters that, that, that are illegal acts? Is it the accounting and disclosure under 450 and what companies are doing there? Is it all of it to some degree? And, and the words really matter relative to how much work one does for those laws and regs that aren't directly related to accounts and disclosures, because the body of work there in a range can, there can be an extraordinary range. And, and that's what people are reading differently in your current proposal. And on the flip side of that, from a benefits perspective, you can't, and we'll get to this later, but you, you can't assume the benefit is getting to zero cost for companies and illegal acts because we're not we're, that's not the role for the auditor. Um, I would also say, um, you know, when you when you kind of when you kind of look at the, um, you know, the the, the the procedures that we perform, I think there's a lot to gain there too. I rattled off a few few procedures earlier, but certainly the levels of inquiry within the organization, review of minutes, review of contracts, review of legal expenses. And there's all kinds of things that we're doing today that aren't necessarily fully articulated uh, in the standards. I don't know that they need to be, but I think what's missing there, and Sandy referenced it, there are other applicable risk assessment standards that go to the work that we do in that space um, relative to ASC 450 and accounting for uh, contingencies, loss contingencies, so in, in, in the company's work around that. So I, I, I think it's important to, to think about that separately, think about your existing standards, and probably have appropriate reference to those standards and the work that's done done there as well. Thank you, Mr. Curto. Before before we take questions or ha hands, I do want to turn to Mr. Martin and Mr. Bell in that order to see if you want to add anything to this latest discussion. Not for Martin. Thank you. Mr. Bell. I think you're on mute. about that. Um, I would agree with some of the earlier comments. There's been quite a evolution in risk management by companies. And I think there are a lot of processes that have been put in place since the standard was um, put in place. And I think the biggest um, change that's really occurred is most large companies have compliance functions. And if, if there's an area where the standard could be updated, it's actually in, in the procedures that would be applied in that area without getting into a full compliance audit, um, I think there is an obligation of the auditor to understand um, how the company is trying to manage its risk. Thank you. Um, we're at just about 11.15, and I know there are hands up. 
Um, but let me do this. Let me at least tee up topic two. And I think we've touched on it, so I don't feel as bad about being being where we are time wise. Um, but our second topic, and, and then I'll call people in order they had their hands raised, um, related to direct and direct laws and indirect laws and what people thought of the distinction. Um, there's also a question that maybe I'd like to get to at some point with the prepare and audit committee member of, of how auditors and management are assessing violations of indirect laws and whether that differs. Um, so let me start, and I, I know then, um, I just wanna make sure I say it in case we run out of time. I know you're all very busy people. And so thank you so much for deciding to spend your, your morning with us. We so appreciate your time and preparation that went into this. So topic two, and um, may, maybe any kind of wrap up remarks, uh, I will start with Mr. Payo here. So, um... Maybe I'll start with finishing the last topic and then go into the other, although I think I've, I've pretty much um, given my thoughts on direct versus indirect. But I just wanted to say from a management perspective and relying on management, yes, I agree with all of those comments. I also just want to clarify or at least make sure that it's clear in, in people's minds. Um, the procedures that, that uh, you were just asking about, I, I think generally the profession, although I suppose I can't speak for the profession, we're, we're happy to um, think about uh, the robustness of those procedures and, and whether we should be doing more. That's, that's really not an issue for us. So we already do a lot of things to identify non-compliance, whether it's direct or indirect. So for example, we send attorney letters, we have great discussions with attorneys in-house. We have discussion with lots of people in-house. Um, we review minutes, we review hotline materials. And, you know, through the PCOB inspection program, this is a this is a great thing about the PCOB. Through the inspections program, you can see uh, where, where there are inconsistencies. And, you know, you have a, a target team um, program where you can get really good information about where are the firms inconsistent on those types of procedures? And where do some, some um, firms go above and beyond uh, those normal type procedures that we do? And should we bake those in and codify those into the standards? So I think there's a real opportunity there. We are supportive of um, more guidance or more requirements even around what we should be doing at that, at that level to improve uh, our performance as it relates to non-compliance. Where we really struggle is when, when you know, some of the words in the standard around, um, you know, I'll keep going back to preventing, that's, that's just one of the words, but where, where our responsibilities then move well beyond what we are asked to do right now and again, I, I just think that do, do investors really want us checking to make sure the company's process will the um, OSHA warnings on the break room walls? Is that is that what we should be doing? Um, because that's the path that the standard is is heading us down versus you know, strengthening those procedures that we were just talking about, we are fully supportive of trying to, to codify and strengthen those. Thank you, Mr. Pale. Um, I see two hands up. Um, so so let, let me go to, uh, I think Doug might have had his hand up first and then Sandy. Yes, I just like to comment a few things. The, the direct versus indirect is in other places, but that's, I think, only because uh, in those other places, they had no choice. That was the auditing standard at the time. So there was nothing else to use unless, uh, you know, Congress gonna, was going to set its own standards and it would do that. So the fact that it's in uh, 10 cap A uh, and uh, there are other references as well, I don't think is significant. Uh, I think the standard should put more emphasis on the risk of material misstatement, but you, you must 
get into reasonably possible then if you do it. That's risk of material misstatement is typically defined as the likelihood is reasonably possible and the magnitude, which is the same as materiality. So uh, although, although there could be more references in the standard of the risk of material misstatement, I don't think it's separable from that reasonably possible and material threshold. Uh, a lot of work is done in ICFR already, and I did want to mention that, in the control understanding and testing the control environment and management's risk assessment process and the uh, aspects of the information system that capture events other than transactions for presentation in the financial statements. And uh, finally, and a lot of the work that's done in the fraud detection area would certainly apply. Uh, some illegal acts are intentional and some are unintentional. If they're intentional, that's fraud. If they're unintentional, that's uh, an error. Uh, and I, I did not want to leave without pointing to the confusion in the standard itself. It wasn't uh, intended that way, but the standard effectively says if it has a direct effect on the determination of financial statement amounts, it omits disclosure, which is probably the biggest failing. You can't omit disclosure from financial reporting, and the, san and the standard certainly does as it's written now. But it says, in effect, if it has a direct effect on uh, the determination of financial statement amounts, then you look at other auditing standards not this standard. And if it's one of those other violations of laws and regulations, it has an indirect effect. That's what this standard applies to. And uh, most people, including auditors, uh, don't uh, really understand that. Uh, and that because the standard itself says, well, after explaining direct and indirect it says, Effectively, here and after, we're going to call indirect just illegal acts. When, so when people talk about the responsibility for illegal acts, uh, it's really only indirect. But I think you should jettison that that uh, distinction, as I made clear before. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, Mr. Owens? Yes, thank you, Barb. I, I, I think the last thing here that I really wanted to touch upon is that what I'm hearing from the number of procedures that are being listed here, those procedures are really about informing the auditor's risk assessment, continuing to build awareness of non-compliance that has occurred in the organization, right? So we're inquiring with management to understand kind of where they where they see the risk of material misstatement related to non-compliance with their financial statements whether or not non-compliance has occurred, how they think about that. We're looking for board minutes to see if there's things there that are being reported that are indicators of non-compliance and things that could potentially impact the financial statements as well. And, and so as I think about the procedures and maybe you know where I'm hearing the dialogue going, it's really about continuing to strengthen those auditor procedures of, around the risk assessment to inform where that risk of material misstatement lies within the financial statements due to non-compliance. And so when I think about it in that lens and thinking about the direct and indirect, I do believe that how we think about the risk of material misstatement related to those items that directly impact the financial statements may still benefit from the concept of thinking about whether or not there is a direct impact to the financial statements from the law and reg, or whether or not you might be a step removed from the financial statements, meaning that you're thinking about it from a loss contingency perspective. So I do think that distinction still might help in practice from the perspective of the risk assessment, but I don't know once one the auditor identifies a risk of material misstatement, there's any further distinguishing, call it procedures, because now you have that risk. And now the auditor is going to respond to that risk. Thank you. Um, hear from Ms. Peters and then Mr. Bell and then Mr. Turner.
Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I think we're using the term direct and indirect, like we all have the same understanding of what that means, right? Because the 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 moment a law or violation is or a law or regulation is violated, there's a potential contingency, right? And it becomes direct, right? And and so it's sort of a it, it, you know to me it's a false distinction, right? And there are degradations of that. Um, but that, um, at, you know, there may be disclosures and there may be contingencies that need to be recognized. But from an investor perspective, they care about the ones that are going to relate to a material misstatement of the financial statements. So not hanging the OSHA thing in the in the break room is sort of a it's a it, you know, it's, it's sort of a red herring or a lost leader in this whole conversation in the sense of and that's certainly not what investors want. They're worried about the risk of a material misstatement of the financial statements. And they're caught off guard by the fact that these things happen and they go from being indirect to a very large direct effect on the financial statements. And certainly the auditors can't prevent that, but it's really understanding the business and the potential for those um, 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 events that could have a, an impact on the financial statements. And, you know, I think what investors are, what investors question is, is that when these things come out, they've been going on for quite some time, right? It's just that they become a big deal, a big deal all of a sudden. So I think, you know, I, I think that as we continue to discuss this standard and the need to revise it, because I, I think there's absolutely no question that there needs to be something done here. The question is the language related to it, that we sort of have to set aside the every law and regulation urban legend, and we have to um, set aside that um, investors want management to do something that, that, that or, or aside from what management's doing or step in the shoes of management, right? And really think about how we get to, I think, as, um, as Kyle said, making better risk assessments of non-compliance and laws and regulations that can have a material impact on the financial statements, whether, whether they be direct or indirect. And I, I, I almost think we have to take that language out of our um, lexicon because I think it's anchoring us to the past when there's a whole lot of laws and, th and regulations Sarbanes-Oxley, 10A, that have happened since this was written. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Um, Mr. Turner, Mr. Croto, and then I don't think we've called on Mr. Coates, and I think that will probably bring us up to time. Yeah, I think you skipped over me. This is Mr. Bell. Thank you. Mr. Bell, did you have, go ahead, please. You had your hand up. Sure. <laughs> yeah, um, coming back to the topic of direct and indirect, I think the distinction between the two on the determination of the financial statement in the current standard is useful um, for auditors to prioritize and manage resources um, in the procedures that are applied in an audit. There may be better terms, but I think the concept is right, and that is to try to focus on the risk of misstatement. And I would also say that while it's true that indirect laws and regulations can result in material misstatements, it's also true that direct laws and regulations have a generally have a higher likelihood of resulting in a material misstatement. So I think some type of dis distinction and prioritization is important, um, particularly for industries that are highly regulated. Can I just, can I, just I, can I agree with you on that? I, I don't mean to interrupt. Right. I completely agree with you. But I think the distinction is being used to indicate the relationship with the financial statements, not the relationship related to the risk of material misstatement. So I agree with you, and in our comment letter, we made um, a, 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 we made that point. But as I hear the conversation, we're using it in its direct connection to the financial statements, not in its direct connection to the risk of material misstatement. So I just wanted to agree I, with you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the focus should be on the risk of material misstatement. Great. Just to give context in the within the insurance industry as far as what we have to track on this topic, um, during last year, we tracked over 5,100 and some changes in general insurance laws, regulations, bulletins, and circular letters. 
in the 50 states alone. And so that that's just general insurance um, regulation and laws. It does not include the laws that cover for, uh, regulatory financial reporting, related capital requirements. And there's also other types of laws and regulations that we track that impact human resources, employment, tax, SEC related matters. So I think it's helpful from the, the auditor's perspective to have some type of distinction to prioritize um, the risk. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, Mr. Turner and then Mr. Croto. Uh, uh, indirect notion, Doug was right about this. When it was originally put in the standard um, back in 76, first part of 77, it came out of hearings on the profession at the time because of illegal acts and bribes and payments from uh, the Watergate scandal uh, days. And the profession didn't have any standard. Congress held hearings, and so the profession adopted something. But the indirect was to limit their exposure and what they had to do. And as the standard said, on indirect, you only have to do something if it comes to your attention. If it doesn't do come to your attention, for all practical purposes, you didn't have to do uh, anything. You might get a rough letter or whatever at that point in time. And we've moved well beyond that since that point in time with systems, with processes, um, and, and quite frankly, society expects uh, more. And the uproar got to a uh, almost a rabid level when Wells Fargo blew up. And we can't afford to have any more Wells Fargo's. That was a situation of indirect being improperly applied. The focus has to get pulled off of whether it's indirect or not. It has to be on, are you making are you being exposed to a material misstatement in those financial statements, disclosure number or otherwise? And your procedures have to be focused on that. Auditors themselves don't understand the difference between indirect and direct. I could give you a list of 20 things, give them to auditors, have them take a test as to which was direct and indirect, and heck, at least half would flunk. And so it's confusing. Uh, Sandy talks about confusing uh, to the investors. I'm not sure the investors. Um, investors have an, a reasonable expectation that the auditor will perform the audit to detect material errors and fraud by whatever purpose. And that they have that understanding because that's what the auditor tells them in the audit report. So the notion that there's an indirect or direct notion, auditors don't ever see, or I mean, investors don't ever see most of them, you know, 99% wouldn't have a clue as to what you're talking about. And, and again, I don't think uh, a lot of auditors have a clear understanding as, as well with respect to that. So I think moving the attention totally off that back onto what the auditor's real obligation is, will get them focused on the risk of the material uh, misstatements. And the notion of an OSHA notice in the break room is ridiculous. I mean, that's not what the standard says. The standard doesn't say you can't rely on management stuff. The standard doesn't say you have to be attorney. In fact, it says use a specialist, a lawyer is a specialist, as we do in other situations. So some of these accusations about where the standard takes, I'd ask you to point me to the words because the words just aren't in that standard. F6. Um, th thank you, Mr. Turner. I know Mr. Martin said he had to drop off. Anything you want to add before you leave, Mr. Martin? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Croto, and, and then I want to make sure I hear from Mr. Coates since we haven't I've talked to him in this round. 
Okay, thanks, Barb. Um, it's an interesting discussion on 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 ten cap A direct indirect. I mean, I, you know, in my former um, life at the SEC for a number of years, I, I used to come in on Monday mornings and the fax machine would be beeping and I'd put paper and we received ten cap A letters through the fax machine that would come through th from the weekend. And there's a lot that has served us well. I, again, I think there's a bit of a lightning rod here, but I don't want people to go away confused because I don't think it's that hard relative to direct and indirect. So. Um, so that others can get the test right in the future that might not today. <laughs> um, if it's direct, it relates to particular accounts and disclosures and the accounting in those accounts and disclosures. If it's indirect, we're talking about potential loss contingencies and accruals. And I don't think that that's confusing. I think it's actually helpful to, um, to have a distinction. But as I said at the outset, it seems like it's a lightning rod and it seems like people would rather not talk about it. And I'm fine with that, if, if other than 10 cap A, where we have to obviously apply it. But I think what you could almost do, Barb, is look, the direct stuff is stuff that, again, tax law and pension, and that's covered by reasonable assurance. So you can almost forget that that exists and we'll deal with 10 cap A and then focus the discussion only on everything else here. Forget, because all the rest is, is indirect. And then it's what do we do around all of the rest. And I think that's the discussion we're trying to have here today. I don't think anybody's debating about what we should do around the stuff that's direct today where we already have reasonable assurance. So you could do away with that distinction, certainly at least in this discussion, and, and it won't change a single thing. But we still have to resolve how much work do we do over identification. It sounds like there's a lot of consensus that we can look to what companies are doing. Then we think about what we know about the industry, the geography, lots of things about the company. In, in, in thinking about completeness, but it's not going all the way to identifying every possible law and reg. And then what do we do, what, what few people have talked about today is what do we do about detection? And I think what we're coalescing around is, is a lot of discussion around the procedures auditors perform, including the, the, those that Christian rattled off and I rattled off some on the inquiries we make, the correspondence we review, the legal fees that we look to, and, and others. And, and when, you, when you start to look at that, relative to de potential detection. I think that's what is reasonable. It's, it's what we do in practice in many cases today, although like Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do more um, as long as we go through the right cost benefit analysis and, 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 and think through um, the extent of it. And it, it, it's, it, it passes that, that test, which I think there's room for some more. But I, I think it just needs to be very clear what's not expected as well, because and, and to Sandy's point, some transparency around that, because we will create an expectation gap that in hindsight, we were able or should have either detected an illegal act that, you know, we didn't, we, we wouldn't have had the ability to know, or that we prevent it in some way, which goes with, to, to what Lynn's describing. I mean, to say that we can't have another, and you know, an, another example of some large company that's had reputational failure or reputational harm, significant reputational harm, Auditors cannot stop that. If a company or management, if a management wants to commit an illegal act or unknowingly does so, we're not going to be able to necessarily stop that. Again, there may be an indirect, and I see Sandy shaking her head, right? Like I, there may be an indirect consequence of this that's a benefit, but, but that can't be the obligation of, of, of the auditor. So um, and, and anyway, hopefully that helps. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Coates, and then we'll wrap up with Mr. Carmichael. Or um, I, I generally echo the view that the direct indirect is more of a confusion than it is a real um, distinction that needs to either be preserved or changed. I think it would be helpful if in whatever final um, uh, version of the document that will be standing there for the world to read, that is on packed a little bit because I think non people who are not inside the audit world who are both in favor of eliminating the direct reference or against eliminating the direct reference both ends of the spectrum currently in the comment letters are are exhibiting confusion relative to this discussion so I think unpacking it and making it clear that an auditor has uh, no 
good defense. It's only indirect we did, and it's also true that if it's direct in a conventional sense, a tax accrual or what have you, that, that they kind of have no ability to avoid being directly engaged in assessing the calculation involved in the basis for it. I, I, I want to put one little note of hesitancy on prioritization here, because you could imagine, I think not implausibly, a tax accrual that's pretty small, where the amount of work you want the auditor to do is pretty small, and you could have a loss contingency assessment that could swallow the company if they don't have any FCPA compliance work at all, uh, and the auditor knows that. So I like prioritization doesn't completely track direct or indirect, I don't think. And let me end with just one note on prevention, because it um, has come up a few times. I'm sure it'll come up again later. Um, I, it's absolutely right that I don't think it makes sense to write anything that implies auditors or guarantors or ultimately contingently liable for the non-compliance of their audit clients. I, I'm, if that's what I hear Brian worrying about, I'm with you. Um, but uh, in fact, auditors do prevent law breaking. And the way they do it, for example, and this is a real example based on a real matter I was involved in, is where a financial institution had law breaking occur. It was a minor amount and it didn't get noticed for perfectly understandable reasons. And probably no one would have wanted the company to invest to, you know, in a system that would have detected it initially. But what then happened was it accumulated over years across multiple uh, counterparties and aggregated to hundreds of millions of dollars. All right. And along the way, that company did not recognize clear internal reports, complaints, indications that employees were aware of the problem. So what became a minor inadvertent mistake turned into fraud. And the auditors had an opportunity repeatedly in principle during that multi-year process to ask management questions about whether they, how and when they were taking account of the internal reports and, and or not accelerating um, and, and addressing it. And again, I wouldn't want the, to be heard to say the auditor ought to bear culpability necessarily, but I, it's just the kind of example where prevention actually can happen. It can be very useful for the company and for its investors. And it's something I don't want to get lost in the sort of simple idea that you're out there stopping the the you know the the uh, the pollution from going in the river like of course not but this other more system based way of actually preventing things is a more realistic thing for the big uh, for the bigger companies with very good compliance functions i'll stop thank you um brian did you want to respond to that quickly before we move to doug i know we're, we're, yeah, we're just, starting to get way behind yeah just really quickly and I, I appreciate the acknowledgement that you know we're not stopping things from being dumped in the river and, and, and there are limitations and I fully agree there's a there can be a, an indirect preventative benefit here um, and I also just want to comment that we today under 10a have obligations we, we make the inquiries we make and we have obligations if we become aware of an illegal act to report that appropriately and all the way up to the SEC if if, if the right things are not done from a management and audit committee perspective no, no problem with further articulating that or reinforcing that and from time to time, um, that's been reinforced, including when I was in my old role at the SEC. Um, it, it, I think that's fine. Um, and, and I think that's consistent with what, what, what John said. But I, I think the, the, the distinction between all of that and otherwise being um, in a role of, 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 of preventing are two different things and in a role of detecting, there's limitations to, to how far we can go reasonably without conducting a compliance audit. Thank you, Mr. Croto. Final word, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the, the standard as it is uh, refers to a direct effect on material financial statement. Determination of material financial statement amounts does not include disclosures. I don't know what direct effect on disclosures might actually be, but it's not in the standard. Uh, I apologize if we're going to talk about this more later, but I think 
there are frameworks in the standards for things that are difficult and complex, like related parties and going concern. And related parties takes a, uh, what I call a risk of material in the statement approach, which of course is there all, always, but it seems to emphasize those things because of the difficulty of knowing all related parties. And I put the going concern in the uh, must evaluate category. That is, you have a whole bunch of procedures that are or ordinarily part of the audit that we've mentioned, like reading minutes, getting lawyers letters, and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's that the auditor is directed to have a requirement to having to evaluate all those things to consider, consider them. So I, those are other possible frameworks. I would, I would lean toward risk of material and statement approach used in related parties, but, but I think those are th some things to consider as well. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. And th thank you everyone for all your input. It's just really invaluable to us. Um, please feel free to submit any additional comments on, on these topics or others to the comment file. Um, for the general public, this concludes our first panel of the day. We will reconvene at 12.30 p.m. Uh, I, again, I can't thank our panelists enough for participating and sharing your views. And thank you to those of, of you who have joined us online today. We will see you at 12.30 on the same link. Thanks so much, everyone.